it's my great honor and privilege to be here with you. And thank you all for coming and for having me at this event. So I will be talking today about some recent advancements in treatment of bleeding disorders. Uh, I have no financial disclosures or conflict of interest in relation to this presentation. I will be discussing, however, some off-label uses of some of the FDA-approved treatments, and also I will be discussing some treatments that haven't been FDA-approved yet. And uh, uh, just keeping track of time here, so just um, the outline of what I will be covering today. First, I would like to review what happens under normal conditions when your blood forms a clot. Then we'll talk about some recent advancements in von Willebrin disease. I will highlight some of the issues, health issues, for uh, hemo female hemophilia carriers, so for women and girls who have hemophilia. And then we will end by talking about some new and emerging therapies for hemophilia A and hemophilia B, including gene therapy. So, uh, interesting, this slide didn't quite come out, but um, when we talk about normal blood clotting, there are th uh, uh, three main stages. So th the first thing that happens when there is an injury is that your blood vessel constricts. And you can see it in this top picture where blood vessel is narrowed, and this can happen because in the blood vessel wall, we actually have smooth muscle layer, and this allows for the blood vessel to constrict. Uh, uh, and the reason uh, for this is because uh, we need to slow the blood flow, and as blood flow slows, it allows platelets, which are the sticky cells in the blood, and you can see it in the second picture, come in closer contact with the blood vessel wall, and platelets become activated. So if you see on the left, the platelets are have nice round, uh, they're nice and round and have this smooth surface, but as they become activated, they form these projections and this uh, facilitates platelets sticking to the blood vessel wall to the site of injury and spreading themselves uh, on the blood vessel wall. The next thing that happens is that the von Willebrand factor comes in, and von Willebrand factor acts as a glue to hold the platelets in place at the site of injury, and this allows all the other blood clotting factors, the blood clotting proteins that are in your blood, you, they are not shown in the picture because they're much, much smaller than your platelets, for example. This allows all these blood clotting factors to start working in this, compl uh, in this you know, complex chain reaction. And this reaction um, culminates in the formation of fibrin, which is another protein, and it is a major component of a blood clot. It's this gelatinous glue-like substance that holds the blood clot together. So, um, as you can see, there are four main components that are involved in normal blood clotting. There is a blood vessel wall, platelets, von Willebrand factor, and clotting proteins. And a defect in any of these four components will result in bleeding. For example, patients who have connective tissue disorder, so these are patients who have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome,
uh, he published this pedigree, and this is what we now know as von Willebrand disease, which was named after him. Von Willebrand disease affects both males and females. Most people with von Willebrand disease have mild bleeding, but you know there are some patients who have very severe bleeding. So severity in von Willebrand disease uh, varies significantly from mild to severe. And symptoms of von Willebrand disease include nosebleeds, easy bruising, bleeding from minor cuts, gum bleeding, bleeding after surgery and dental procedures, and in women, heavy menstrual bleeding and bleeding after childbirth. Uh, so inherited von Willebrand disease is divided into three types. Type one is the most common. 80 to 85% of patients have type one von Willebrand disease. In type 1 von Willebrand disease, the problem is that the von Willebrand factor is present, but it, it, it is present in low amount. So it, uh, it is reduced, and as a result, these patients bleed. Bleeding usually is mild in type 1, but occasionally we do see uh, patients with type 1 disease who have severe bleeding. Second most common type is type 2. It's present in about 15% of patients of, with von Willebrand disease. And type 2 is divided into four different subtypes. The bleeding in type 2 von Willebrand disease is usually of moderate severity. And the problem in type 2 von Willebrand disease is that the von Willebrand factor uh, is not functioning normally. So you make enough of it. There is enough of the protein but the protein is defective, so the protein does not do its job properly. And the, mold, and the type 3 is very rare, only about less than 5% of patients have type 3, and there is little or no von Willebrand factor in type 3, and these patients have very severe bleeding, similar to what patients with hemophilia have. Um, and just to mention, we certainly do follows up some patients who have acquired von Willebrand disease. And acquired von Willebrand disease is, is a very uh, separate category. Uh, a lot of things that we will be discussing for inherited von Willebrand disease would not necessarily apply to, von to acquired von Willebrand disease. These are the um, treatment options that are currently available for von Willebrand disease. We have non-factor medications, and those include desmopressin, uh, uh, Desmopressin is a synthetic copy of your naturally occurring hormone. And uh, Desmopressin is available as a nasal spray or it can, is available intravenously in being injected into vein. What Desmopressin does, it uh, makes you, you release von Willebrand factor that is stored into the circulation. And this way, it increases levels of von Willebrand factor in the circulation and also factor eight in the circulation. Um, so uh, we use desmopressin in von Willebrand, but we also sometimes use it for mild hemophilia because it not only releases von, increases von Willebrand factor, but also factor eight. Antifibrinolytics examples are tranexamic acid or aminocaproic acid. These medications are available as tablets, syrup, mouthwash, or they can be injected into vein, uh, so they are also available intravenously. Th these work by stabilizing blood clot. And then we have von Willebrand factor concentrates. Uh, they are divided into plasma-derived, um, and plasma-derived concentrates have both von Willebrand factor and factor VIII in them. And there is one recombinant von Willebrand factor uh, product available, and this product is manufactured in cell lines, so it's not derived from human plasma, uh, and it's, um, it does not have factor VIII. So these treatments, uh, with the exception of maybe recombinant von Willebrand factor, have been around for decades. We know that they are safe, uh, we know that they are effective, but we also know that uh, patients with von Willebrand disease uh, have a low uh, quality of life, and continue to suffer from bleeding complications. So we desperately want new improved treatments and better management strategies for these patients. Despite von Willebrand disease being the most common inherited bleeding disorder, uh, the development of new treatments for von Willebrand disease actually has lagged behind hemophilia, for example. And the reason for this, uh, there are many reasons, but uh, some of the reasons I listed here 
uh, we we um, already discussed that von Willebrand disease is much more is much more complex. There are many different types of von Willebrand disease. The pathophysiology of bleeding is more complex. There is factor eight. There is von Willebrand factor. Patients with von Willebrand disease have very variable bleeding, and they also have different type of bleeding. For example, in patients with hemophilia, severe hemophilia, we can count the number of joint bleeds, then give a new therapy to a patient, and then count number of bleeds on new therapy and compare what happens and how effective this new therapy is. For patients with von Willebrand disease, because bleeding is predominantly nose bleeds or uh, GI bleeding or menstrual bleeding, this type of bleeding is very difficult to measure. So, um, uh, so you, you know, you can see that there are some challenges when you think about designing clinical trials for these patients. So, where do we where do we go um, from here? And before we can really start to address a problem and try to solve a problem, problem being not. Um, you, you know, need for better treatments in von Willebrand disease. We, we need to be able to really define the problem. We need improved um, diagnostic strategies for von Willebrand disease, and we also need to identify what are our top priorities for um, management von Willebrand disease. And this uh, was. Um, addressed uh, or, you know, the first step toward this was uh, development of these guidelines that were published in 2021, and the guidelines were on the diagnosis and also on management of von Willebrand disease. And these guidelines, um, the questions that were chosen to be addressed in these guidelines um, were um, identified from the survey, not only from the healthcare providers, but also from patients. So these guidelines, the goal of these guidelines was to identify uh, future uh, areas that need uh, more research and to also improve the quality of life for patients with von Willebrand disease. A couple of areas that were uh, identified uh, from the survey from patients and providers as high priority in von Willebrand disease, I want to very briefly mention. I know that there is a separate talk on mucocutaneous bleeding, so I'm not going to discuss this in detail, but I do want to mention that heavy menstrual bleeding was identified as one of the uh, top um, uh, priorities for uh, future research for von Willebrand disease. And, um, um, and uh, a question that was posed in the guidelines was, in women with von Willebrand disease and heavy menstrual bleeding, should you use tranexamic acid, hormonal therapy, which is either IUD or hormonal contraceptives, or desmopressin? And um, you can see that uh, there wasn't even a question about uh, von Willebrand factor concentrate um, um, you know, the, the, that wasn't one of the choices in this uh, question. Mm -hmm. Since the guidelines were published, there was actually uh, this uh, small clinical trial that was uh, uh, published by Dr. Ragni. And in this clinical trial, uh, tr um, um, women who had mild and moderate von Willebrand disease and heavy menstrual bleeding were randomized, they were randomly assigned to receive either recombinant von Willebrand factor infusion on day one of their menstrual period, or uh, they were treated with tranexamic acid, two tablets three times a day for five days, which is the standard dosing regimen for tranexamic acid for menstrual bleeding. The women were followed for two menstrual cycles, uh, the amount of bleeding was assessed using a specialized pictorial chart. And then uh, the treatments were switched. So the women who, a group of women who were initially treated with recombinant von Willebrand factor for the cycle three and cycle four uh, were treated with tranexamic acid. And women who were initially treated with uh, tranexamic acid for the first two menstrual cycles were switched to receive recombinant von Willebrand factor for cycle three and uh, menstrual cycle and cycle four. And again, the response was assessed. So what this small study determined uh, is that a recombinant von Willebrand factor was not better than tranexamic acid in reducing heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, 
but I think what I, is, is um, also very important is that either treatment, either recombinant von Willebrand factor or tranexamic acid did not decrease bleeding enough, so it was no longer heavy bleeding. So there was some decrease in bleeding, but both uh, groups of women still had, had, still had heavy menstrual bleeding. So this just highlights that the treatments we have are not very good and that we need um, you know, better treatments. Another area that was um, identified as um, an area of high priority for investigation in von Willebrand disease was the question of prophylaxis in von Willebrand disease. We do use prophylaxis. This is the standard of care for severe hemophilia A and B. But the role for prophylaxis in von Willebrand disease is less clear. So what the guidelines suggested is that for patients with von Willebrand disease who have severe and frequent bleeds, uh, long-term prophylaxis should be used over no, long, no prophylaxis. But this was a low quality evidence, uh, and this was a conditional recommendation, meaning that the decisions have to be made uh, on a case-by-case -case basis between provider and patient. But we all know that prophylaxis uh, with intravenous products can be burdensome. So there's been recently a lot of interest in using emicizumab, uh, which uh, some of you in this audience may know, um, because it's approved FDA-approved treatment for hemophilia A. Uh, and emicizumab is a subcutaneous injection. So there's been a lot of interest in using em emicizumab for severe type 3 von Willebrand disease. And it is currently under investigation. Uh, so just what is emicizumab? It's a humanized bispecific monoclonal antibody uh, that mimics what factor eight normally does. And that's how it works in hemophilia. So you can see in the top diagram, you can see that uh, this is uh, when factor eight is present. Factor eight brings factor nine and factor 10 together. Um, and um, uh, promotes clotting this way, but when factor eight is not present and emicizumab is present, emicizumab does the same job. Again, emicizumab is not approved for von Willebrand disease, uh, uh, but it is approved for hemophilia. So next I want to mention a couple of uh, emerging uh, compounds um, that might have a role in treatment of von Willebrand disease and also other bleeding disorders. The first one is um, uh, uh, an agent called BT200. And you can see it here in the picture. So on the left, uh, in this you know, orange and yellow, that's the drug. And the um, you know, purple and teal color structure is your von Willebrand factor. So, this agent is uh, also given subcutaneously. It has a half-life of, of about seven to 10 days. And it, in circulation, it binds to the von Willebrand factor and decreases clearance of von Willebrand factor. As a result, von Willebrand factor levels go up. And um, so right now, it's still in early clinical trials, but it is being investigated uh, potentially for use in patients with mild and moderate hemophilia, and also for women with von Willebrand disease who have heavy menstrual bleeding. So as you can see, uh, this agent potentially would have applications in more than one type of a bleeding disorder. Another emerging, treat, uh, emerging a, uh, drug that I want to mention is uh, uh, HMB001. So this compound actually is a bispecific antibody. So if you remember emicizumab, hemlibra, is also a bispecific antibody. So this is in some way similar to, similar to hemlibra. And uh, uh, what this uh, drug does, it brings activated factor seven to the surface of the activated platelet and promotes clotting this way. So this, uh, HMB001 uh, drug is being studied in uh, patients with Glanzmann thrombostenia, which is very exciting because there aren't many treatments for Glanzmann thrombostenia. 
but it also has potential to treat other bleeding disorders, other platelet uh, function disorders, such as Bernard Soulier, and also von Willebrand disease. So the next uh, group of bleeding disorders that we will talk about uh, is hemophilia. As you all know, hemophilia is, is a hereditary lifelong bleeding disorder in which there is a partial or total lack of an essential blood clotting factor. Hemophilia A is factor eight deficiency, and hemophilia B is factor nine deficiency, and hemophilia A and B are the most common types of hemophilia. We classify hemophilias by um, severity and by level of factor. So severe uh, is less than 1% of factor, moderate between one and 5%, mild is between five and 40%, and, um, and in some, uh, some guidelines actually suggest between five and 50%, but usually between five and 40%. So anything about 40% uh, typically considered to be um, near normal non-hemophilia range. Factor eight and factor nine genes are located on the X chromosome. So a traditional view uh, was that men are affected and have the disease and women are carriers. But as you probably maybe experienced yourself, some of you in the audience, and certainly I heard uh, from providers and patients, sometimes this concept becomes really a barrier to clinical care. I, I've heard from providers who uh, were seeing a, uh, a, a female patient with hemophilia, a hemophilia carrier, who were not really clear what this means and if they need to be worried about bleeding. And I've also uh, you know, certainly heard from uh, female patients with hemophilia who have low factor levels who were seen in urgent care or emergency rooms and were told that they don't need to worry about bleeding because uh, they are carriers, they cannot have hemophilia, which we know is not true. So how many hemophilia, female hemophilia carriers are there? So we know that for each male with hemophilia, there are three to five possible female carriers and 1.5 definite female carrier. From all women who are hemophilia carriers, about one-third of them have decreased factor levels. And if you look from the other direction, if you look from the uh, perspective of uh, people with mild hemophilia, actually one in five people with mild hemophilia uh, are females. So about 20% of mild hemophiliacs are females. So to avoid this um, sort of uh, confusion and to facilitate clear communication, new ISTH nomenclature has been proposed. And um, what this uh, uh, new nomenclature suggests that for women and girls, or for that re reason, any person uh, with a factor level of less than 40%, so you know we want to include also gender fluid individuals and, and uh, transgender, transgender persons. So anybody with factor level of less than 40% should be classified according to their factor level. So we should, for uh, these patients, we should try to get away from calling them uh, carriers. We should uh, just call them mild, moderate, or severe hemophiliacs. And for men with hemophilia, you know, we have a lot of research on uh, health consequences of having hemophilia, um, you know, on quality of life and, and uh, health problems. Um, but we are only starting to learn about health issues in uh, hemophilia carriers and in females with hemophilia. What we do know is that uh, Females with hemophilia bleed, and the bleeding is a little bit different, but uh, the bleeding um, that we see uh, is heavy menstrual bleeding, postpartum hemorrhage, bleeding after dental procedures, bleeding after surgical procedures, and also what we are starting to appreciate that is that female uh, hemophilia carriers can have joint bleeds. 
at least, again, these are still small studies and we still are uh, accumulating uh, knowledge about this and learning about this, but at least in one study, joint bleeding was reported in 8 to 16% of hemophilia 8 carriers. There was another study that compared range of motion of female, joint range of motion for female hemophilia carriers with normal female uh, control group. And uh, it's, that study found that uh, female hemophilia carriers have decreased range of motion in their joints. Some other health issues uh, that we encounter in this population uh, are iron deficiency. These um, patients often have lower health-related quality of life scores. And um, there is a, a possibly a risk, increased risk of osteoporosis and decreased bone mineral density. We don't know this for sure, but, uh, and there are some studies looking into this right now, but as you probably know, there is some evidence that factor eight and von Willebrand factor are important for uh, uh, bo maintaining bone integrity and maintaining bone health. So again, we are trying to catch up and there is more work uh, to be done for this. A uh, new nomenclature for uh, female carriers is the step in the right direction. And um, we desperately need more clinical trials for patients with mild hemophilia because our female patients, uh, uh, carriers, mo most of which are in the mild hemophilia range, can also participate in these clinical trials. So this brings us to the next uh, portion of my talk, which will be to talk about uh, the available treatments for hemophilia, to highlight some of the more recently approved uh, treatments, and then also talk about some of the uh, agents that are coming down the pipeline. As you all know, for hemophilia A and hemophilia B, factor concentrates have been the mainstay of uh, prophylaxis and also treatment of bleeding for decades. But you also know that this, is, uh, this type of treatment represents high burden to patients, to their families. Despite being effective, we still see breakthrough bleeding with factor concentrates. We also um, see that there is progression of joint disease in many cases, despite factor concentrate prophylaxis. And not to mention the most um, devastating consequence of uh, factor therapy, which is development of uh, inhibitors. In 2014, the first extended half-life uh, product was approved. And over the last close to 10 years, since 2014, there have been 12 factor products uh, that have been licensed in the United States. Most of these are extended half-life products. You can see factor eight products um, shown in black and factor nine products that are uh, in purple. The first non-factor treatment that was approved was Hemlibra and that was approved in 2017. And then in the last couple of years, we um, have now two gene therapies that have been approved. Uh, one for hemophilia B and one for hemophilia A. And certainly there are many um, uh, very promising treatments that are uh, either in late stages of clinical development or being reviewed uh, uh, for licensure under FDA. When we talk about available therapeutics for hemophilia, they're usually uh, divided into four categories. So the first category is clotting factor replacement. This includes your standard half-life and extended half-life products. Then there is substitution therapies, and that's your uh, hemlibra is the example of this. There are rebalancing therapies and gene therapies. And uh, you can see, so I, I will, today I will briefly highlight uh, one to two agents in each of these categories, and you can see the ones that are FDA approved uh, have a little FDA sign next to them. And so most of the novel treatments for hemophilia have advantages over our standard uh, factor concentrate treatment. Many of these uh, are delivered subcutaneously rather than intravenously. 
Many of these agents have significantly decreased frequency of administration. They provide better steady state levels, so there are no peaks and troughs, so the patients are not as tied to the timing of the you know, uh, treatment. They, they can uh, treat and then um, you know, the levels are sustained, so they are not, don't have to plan uh, about when their next infusion will be. They have uh, higher trough levels in some instances, and uh, most of them also have improved uh, risk of immunogenicity and inhibitor development. So the first uh, agent that I will highlight briefly is uh, Epinesoctacog alpha, or Altuvia. This was FDA approved about a year ago. And this is a factor eight product. So it's in the category of your uh, factor replacement therapies. Uh, it is recombinant uh, factor eight, um, specially engineered molecule that has significant prolongation of its half-life. So you can see in this diagram, uh, the molecule consists of recombinant factor eight that is shown in blue and purple that is fused to the FC portion of the immunoglobulin that is shown in uh, orange. And then there are a couple of additional modifications. So there is this recombinant D prime D3 domain uh, of von Willebrand factor that is bound to the molecule. And uh, also these two green chains, which are the protein chains called X10 insertions. And again, the, the, the rationale for these additional modifications is to extend the half-life of the molecule. Because this molecule does have this recombinant portion of the uh, von Willebrand factor bound to it, when in circulation, it does not bind to your naturally circulating von Willebrand factor. So this allows this molecule um, to, it prolongs its half-life. It, it it's no longer dependent on the half-life of your von Willebrand factor in circulation. And once in the circulation, the molecule is cleaved in a way that this D prime D3 domain is removed, and these X10 insertions are also removed. And basically, you are left with the recombinant factor 8 FC uh, fusion product. But this product has a significantly improved half life. So the half life of uh, EFA, not, EFA uh, for short, uh, is about 47 hours, and it is licensed for once weekly dosing. And if you look at this graph, so on the right-hand side, if you find, so on the right-hand side, you see a factor eight levels shown as a percentages. So after, if you find the 40% um, mark and, and follow the line, you can appreciate that after the infusion, for the first four days after the infusion, the factor eight levels stay above 40%. So this is essentially normal or near normal range. And then at the end of seven days, the trough level is about 10%. So again, significantly uh, improved um, pharmacokinetics. So far, there have not been any reports of inhibitors, uh, allergic reactions, or thrombotic complications. Again, it's been around for, for um, um, in the commercial use for about a year, and hopefully the safety profile will continue to remain good as well. So the second category is our substitution therapies. I already mentioned Hemlibra uh, when I uh, was talking about von Willebrand disease. And even though we've had Hemlibra available for hemophilia A for uh, several years now, we still continue to learn about it and we still continue to uh, you know, explore um, use of emicizumab in, in different clinical scenarios and situations. Examples uh, are that uh, there was a Haven, 7, Haven 6 trial that looked at a use of emicizumab for prophylaxis in patients with mild or moderate hemophilia A. Um, and this trial, actually, I want to emphasize 4% of uh, this was enrolling uh, all genders. So 4% uh, of participants in this trial were women, which is uh, rare. Um, 
Heaven 7 trial looked at emesizumab prophylaxis for our youngest patients, patients who are 12 months of age or younger. And uh, we are also exploring uh, use of emesizumab in, in athletes. And we are continuing to learn about how to manage surgical patients uh, on emesizumab. We are continuing to learn about uh, the impact of emesizumab on inhibitor development and also how to incorporate imicizumab into immune tolerance induction for patients who have uh, inhibitors. So this brings us to, to the next, uh, next uh, category, uh, which are rebalancing therapies. And we don't, currently we do not have any FDA approved uh, agents in this category. So the idea of the rebalancing therapies is that under normal conditions, your um, uh, procoagulants and anticoagulants exist in equilibrium. Uh, and uh, the, uh, what rebalancing uh, treatments do, they, when this balance becomes, uh, becomes uh, you know, when you lose this equilibrium, when this balance is tipped one way or another, uh, these uh, rebalancing therapies can restore the equilibrium. So uh, to demonstrate this, uh, <laughs> so uh, it, I, I think it's not working, but I think what, um, it was supposed to show that, you know, this, uh, in, in hemophilia, there would be no factor eight or factor nine, so this uh, balance would be shifted to the, to the right, so toward bleeding. But then if you deactivate or remove one of the natural anticoagulants, either TFPI molecule or antithrombin-3, you know, this, this balance would be restored. One example of rebalancing therapy is the drug called concizumab. So concizumab is the anti-TFPI antibody. Um, so um, it's a subcutaneously administered medication. It's actually already approved in Canada. Um, again, this is the medication because it's a non-factor medication. It would be effective in, and has been studied in hemophilia A, hemophilia B, and in patients with and without inhibitors. So what this picture shows, so the tissue factor is shown in yellow, and basically tissue factor uh, brings your other clotting factors together and promotes clotting by activating factor 10. Um, the tissue factor inhibitor, which is TFPI molecule that you see in black, typically kind of slows down this reaction. So it kind of, you know, is a break, if you will. And um, as a result, this is your natural anti-clotting agent. So it slows down the normal clotting reaction. But if you treat a patient with concizumab, it neutralizes this uh, TFPI molecule. So it removes the break of this clotting reaction. So now the clotting reaction can, uh, can continue at full speed. And as a result, you generate more thrombin, you generate more clot. And in patients with bleeding disorders, it can restore this equilibrium that we just discussed. So another uh, agent that is in the late stages of clinical development uh, is fitusuran. Fitusuran is also a rebalancing therapy, but it works by a very different mechanism. It is a small, in, uh, small interfering RNA molecule that targets another naturally occurring blood thinner called antithrombin-3. So antithrombin-3, again, is a naturally occurring anticoagulant in your blood. And uh, fetusiran, uh, given by subcutaneous injection, it is monthly or every other month, so very impressive frequency of administration. And it um, basically decreases the, it goes to the liver, it decreases the levels of antithrombin-3 in blood. And as a result, uh, it promotes uh, clotting. Again, this is treatment that would work and is being studied in hemophilia A, hemophilia B, 
and uh, for patients with and without inhibitors. One concern with these rebalancing therapies is that sometimes maybe you can overshoot a little bit and tip this balance a little bit too far to the, to the left toward clotting and uh, actually cause uh, unwanted blood clots. And in the very early clinical studies for both of these agents, there were actually some uh, thrombotic complications and the trials were paused temporarily the um, research teams then developed some risk mitigation strategies. They reviewed and changed the guidelines for administration of other hemostatic agents for patients who are being treated with these uh, agents. And also they revised do dosing regimen for both of these agents. And since that time in, in, in uh, more recent clinical trials, it definitely seemed to have improved uh, its safety profile, and we haven't seen um, uh, many complications in terms of clotting. But again, uh, it's, it remains to be seen how this all will play out and how this will hold up. So finally, this brings us to to uh, gene therapy, which you know is uh, uh, a very different type of treatment. Is is the type of treatment that um, has been under clinical investigations for since 1990s, for close to you know, three decades, and now it is finally here. Um, so first I, I, I will uh, tell you a little bit about what gene therapy and hemophilia is like and, and what happens, and then we'll briefly talk about the two approved treatments. So the idea of gene therapy is that you deliver a normal functional gene into a living cell, um, and uh, then this uh, cell in your body starts manufacturing a missing protein using its own machinery. Um, in hemophilia, gene therapy a product is given as intravenous infusion. So it is given, um, it's a once, uh, one infusion uh, of, and the gene therapy product um, is um, specially engineered that it contains this AAV vector. So AAV vector is AV is uh, adenovirus associated, adeno associated virus shell. So it's a shell of a common virus, AAV. Uh, and inside this shell is um, your factor eight gene or factor nine gene that is packaged inside the shell of a virus. And then this product is infused. It circulates in the blood it uh, goes inside the liver cells, and inside the liver cells, the, uh, the shell of, a, uh, of the viral shell gets degraded, but the gene gets integrated into the nucleus of the liver cell. And once inside the nucleus, again, your own body, your, your own intracellular machinery starts synthesizing factor eight or factor nine, depending on which gene you give to a patient. So treatment, uh, the gene therapy uh, product um, was approved based on the results of this uh, phase three HOPE B trial. And in this trial, there were 54 patients with severe or moderately severe hemophilia B, so factor nine level of 2% or lower. Um, and before these patients were treated with uh, gene therapy, uh, inhibitor patients were uh, excluded, I must say, and um, uh, patients had to have uh, healthy livers. And um, um, before these patients were treated with gene therapy, they were observed for at least six months uh, on their usual factor IX prophylaxis. And this was used to, to document um, the frequency of bleeds and also uh, the use of factor uh, as a baseline. And then these patients received, again, it's a single infusion of um, a gene therapy product, usually it takes a few hours. And then these patients were followed and now we have a follow-up up to three years after, uh, after uh, uh, receiving gene therapy. What is interesting about this, uh, uh, the, the hemophilia B gene therapy product, 
so in as you can imagine, because these the the product is contained in the um, in the viral shell. So the, a lot of us, uh, these are common viruses, so a lot of us uh, get exposure to these viruses at some point over our lifetime. And when our, we get this, exposed to these viruses, our immune system learns to recognize these viruses. So in some patients, um, some patients will have what, what is called neutralizing antiviral antibodies. And there was a concern, and there is, for some gene therapy products, it is still a, a, a concern that if you have these neutralizing antibodies, once you receive the gene therapy product, your immune system may attack it and destroy it before the product has a chance to, to get to the liver. But interestingly enough, uh, in, uh, specifically for hemgenics, for, for hemophilia B gene therapy product, presence of these neutralizing antibodies did not seem to have a negative impact. It, it did for the hemophilia A gene therapy product, but not for hemophilia B gene therapy product. So, and this shows um, two-year follow-up for, uh, for, for the participants of this gene therapy trial. We now have, as I mentioned, three-year follow-up. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the picture for three years, but it looks very, very similar. And what hopefully you can appreciate that uh, the level of factor nine um, over time seems to be very, very stable. And the mean factor nine level for these patients at the end of two years and very similar at the end of three years was about 36 or so you know, percent. It's, it was above 35%. Um, about um, 94 percent, so at, um, so at day 21, 52 out of 54 participants, so after, after infusion of gene therapy product, 21 days later, 52 out of 54 participants were able to come off their factor 9 prophylaxis, and at three-year follow-up, 51 patients, or 94 percent, still remained off prophylaxis. So this you know, seems to demonstrate good, uh, good and stable uh, uh, response. And this just shows that uh, a comparison of bleeding before gene therapy on prophylaxis and after gene therapy uh, was given. And you can see that uh, in all categories, for all bleeds, treated bleeds, uh, spontaneous bleeds, and joint bleeds, there was a reduction uh, on gene therapy compared to prophylaxis of at least 64%, or in some instances higher. Um, of course, we always want to know about adverse events and complications. So 70% of patients experienced a treatment-related adverse event. Most of these were mild, uh, and uh, most of these happened in the first six months of uh, receiving gene therapy product. The most common adverse event was abnormal liver function tests. And uh, um, the, the pathophysiology of abnormal function tests, uh, it, it has to do with the immune response to the gene therapy product. We know that treatment with steroids, uh, when this happens, uh, is effective. 17% of patients had to be treated with steroids in this uh, gene therapy trial. And uh, infusion reaction is another um, side effect uh, that can happen. And infusion reactions happen in about 13% of patients. So to summarize what we know about uh, hemophilia B gene therapy, factor IX expression was sustained at greater than 35% throughout the three-year follow-up period regardless of the presence or absence of pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. And you may ask how many patients had those antibodies. So 21 out of 54 participants. So uh, just a little bit less than 50% of participants had these neutralizing antibodies. We also know that the reduction in bleeding was sustained and was superior to factor IX prophylaxis. And of course, we, all, uh, we still don't know about long-term safety uh, considerations. Will there be something uh, that we um, 
do not have not expected, uh, you know, that remains to be seen. But short term uh, safety appears to be very good. So switching gears a little bit, and now we're going to mention uh, Roctavian or um, uh, gene therapy product for hemophilia A. And I'm just going to highlight a few differences um, between what we just discussed and this product. So this, uh, you can see again the similar plot, uh, two-year follow-up for hemophilia A gene therapy. But if you notice, in, in, in this case, it does appear that the levels, the factor eight levels peak somewhere around six and 12 months after the gene therapy is administered. And then it, it gives the impression that they, they are slowly continue to kind of decrease and you know, dwindle down. Um, so also what is different about this uh, product is that uh, among individuals who receive this gene therapy, we see quite a bit of variability in responses. Some patients maintain factor eight levels in a near normal non-hemophilia range at the end of two years, but for some patients, this, uh, the levels go down to uh, less than 5%. So there is a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, variability. Also for this product, uh, neutralizing, pre-existing neutralizing antibodies do matter. So patients cannot receive this product if they have pre-existing pre neutralizing antibodies, and that's about one third of patients. And uh, more patients on, uh, on, uh, who were treated with Roctavian needed steroids, about 79% of patients. So in conclusion, uh, we uh, discussed today that we do need new treatments and improved management strategies for von Willebrand disease. We also discussed why clinical trials in von Willebrand disease can be a little bit more challenging. Uh, we also discussed that uh, we need more research on our female hemophilia carriers and uh, perhaps uh, more clinical trials for patients with mild hemophilia, which could include uh, many of the female patients. And then finally, we talked about some new and emerging treatments for hemophilia and other bleeding disorders, some of which do show very promising improvements and um, uh, hopefully will provide additional treatment options to our patients. And thank you very much. And I think, I don't know, do we have time for questions?